Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for our free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Nick Majuli. Nick, are you ready to join the mission? Oh, yes, I'm here. I'm ready. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to hearing more uh, of your story, but let me introduce you to the audience. Nick is the Chief Operating Officer and Data Scientist at Ritholtz Wealth Management, where he oversees operations across the firm and provides insights on business intelligence. He's also the author of of dollarsanddata.com, a blog focused on the intersection of data and personal finance. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and Los Angeles Times. Nick graduated from Stanford University with a degree in economics and currently resides in New York City. Nick, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Yeah, as you said, like, you know, when I'm writing on online, I'm talking about, you know, the intersection of data and personal finance slash investing. So I think that's my unique value proposition is just, you know, trying to help, you know, the typical retail investor, like navigate the investment markets. And I do that using data and trying to show as much evidence as possible. So I use a lot of charts, a lot of visuals for that type of stuff. And so it's not that other people haven't done that, but, you know, I have a background a little bit in programming data science. So I've been able to take that skill and marry it with, you know, my love for finance and investing. So I think that's the thing where I'm basically, you know, things we've heard for a long time, buy and hold this and that, should you buy the dip, all these questions, I basically go through and try and, you know, prove, you know, with evidence, with data on what you should be doing. Right. And so I don't, and I don't want to try and give you exactly like a prescription. You need to do this. You need to do that. Like, cause investing is a very dynamic process in one period. It might be good to own a certain asset in another environment. It may not. And so it's a, it's a very dynamic process. It's more of an art than a science at times. Um, but I'm really just trying to help, you know, the typical retail investor and like what works for them. And so that's, that's been my goal. And I, I don't try to like have opinions on things. I try to say like, hey, this is either my experience or I have a lot of data to show something, right? And I've been in the investment industry for, you know, not even five years now, and I'm still mm -hmm. like going out there and trying to talk about this stuff. So I am, based on that, I'm like very inexperienced in that sense. However, I think because I'm using data, it, it actually validates my arguments. And it's because I'm an outsider that I actually have that unique edge, right? I'm not someone who's like been investing for 50 years. And, you know, that's not the the point here. The point is like, look at the data, look at what the evidence says. That's true regardless of not some, you know, not some guru that's trying to say, this is my, my opinion and it's right. I'm trying to say, what does the evidence actually say and why we should follow that? You know, I think for the young people out there that are listening, you're also a really good example of kind of like how to find a job that you really like doing the things that you like to do, but also, you know, write a blog, have a, you know, written a book, you've written, you know, your book, just keep buying as an example and, mm -hmm. and how those things, you know, they link into the job that you have, but you also have the freedom within the job to be able to do these different things. And I think like, that's what a lot of people are looking for in careers, you know, whereas let's say when I started as an analyst back in 1993 here, I was a sell side analyst in Thailand. It's like, that's all you do. There was not any opportunity to do anything else. I mean, I guess I could have written a book, but you know, it just didn't come to my mind. And I'm just curious if you could discuss that briefly, because I know a lot of young people, they, they want to have a bigger, broader experience in their work life. Yeah. So in my case, it just took like a lot of time and effort to get there because like I was blogging for a year, uh, over a year before I even started talking with the firm that I ended up at, Ritholtz. And it was like, I started talking to them after about a year of blogging. So doing, let's say it takes about 10 hours a week to write a blog post. It's taking me less now for a host of reasons. I've gotten obviously a little bit better at it, I hope at least. Um, and so let's imagine 10 hours a week over the course of a year. That's 500 hours I put in before I had any real return from it. Yes, people, some people are starting to read it. I started to get a little bit of traction here and there, but like, even after a whole year, like I only had 5,000 Twitter followers, which like for some people that might seem like a lot, but like conditional now on me having so many more, like it was a very slow process. Right. And so 
I think one of those things to keep in mind is like, there's a very long tail. Like you have to just go through a long, long time of possibly, you know, keeping at it before you find some of these roles. And for me, it's like, I knew I was like, Hey, I would love to work with these guys, but I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if there's even a role for me. Like they were a much smaller firm then they weren't even a billion mm -hmm. dollars. You know, when I joined and now they're, we have over $3 billion in assets. And so, you know, when I was coming in, I'm like, well, you know, can I do data science stuff? And like, sure, like most most registered investment advisors, most wealth management firms don't have data scientists. Maybe some of the really big ones do, but a lot mm -hmm. of the smaller ones don't. So for them, they saw it as a big risk. But I was like, hey, there's a lot of technical skills I can bring, and we can do a lot more. And so I eventually take you know took over operations in a in a way. And so that's been you know really interesting. But it's one of those things where like you can keep you have to keep at it for a long time. And the thing is like it's really like there's tons of barriers there to be like who really wants it. You know, do, are you really willing to put in the work? And so unfortunately, like there's no simple solution to this. But if you're like, hey, I wish I could marry my love for this thing with my love for this thing. You know, that's that's usually that Venn diagram there is what you want to try and find and, and, and maximize on. And so it can take mm -hmm. time too. So just don't, don't get discouraged and just spend time on it. I started when I was 27 and I, it took me until I was like 20 and a half moved into a new industry. And I, you know, the book thing that came out, you know, when I was 32. So it's like, everything's been changing a lot. And so it takes a long time, right? I was writing for five years before I even had the book deal and, and things mm -hmm. went from there. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, when I talk to young people and I'd say, you know, ultimately find your space. Are you, do you like to write? Do you like to do video? Do you like to draw pictures? You know, like there's a space for you, mm -hmm. you know, wherever you are. Uh, and for me, I, I I wasn't necessarily a writer, but I was kind of forced to write as an analyst every single day. And so I was writing. And so, but I never turned that into a blog because I kind of felt like in my free time, I didn't feel like writing, but mm -hmm. I like video and I like that type of stuff. So the first thing I always tell people is, you know, find a thing that you really like to do. And then the second thing is what I hear from you is, <laughs> and then do it consistently. And then opportunities will come, but you may not get that payoff right away. It can take a long time. And I guess most people just quit after a short amount of time. But if you really like it and you're enjoying it, then you know it's probably the way to go. I'm just curious, <clears throat> thinking about that and kind of thinking about people that are listening to this, if you had to, if you started over again today, knowing what you know now about the industry, about blogging, about writing, about all that different stuff. And let's just take a 27 year old listening to this podcast right now. And they say, you know, I want to, you know, get started and I've got some good qualifications. What advice would you give them? I mean, it's, it's really tough. So like, I think you have to prepare yourself mentally for it. like, I almost gave up at nine months. The first year is the hardest. Like it's absolutely the hardest. Like, no, it's not even close. Like the first year was harder than every single thing I've done since. Like not even close, even like, Oh, writing the book. No, writing the book was comparatively easy relative to that first year when you're just like pu publishing pieces or putting out content and sending into the void. Like no one's reading it. You're not seeing it's like, Oh, I got a hundred views on the last week. It's like, that is the thing you have to prepare for. And so Trust me, I made every mistake in the book. I've had probably the slowest growth you can get. You know, I've heard about people, you know, oh, I got my email list for, you know, to, you know, 30,000 readers within like a year or two years or even less than that, right? I'm I'm at 25,000 subs and it's been like seven years. I, mean, I didn't even have an email list when I started. I didn't have an email list for like two years, basically. I had like a medium list. Like, I don't want to get into all that right now, but like <laughs> I made every mistake possible. But regardless of that, I think whatever endeavor you're going to do, mentally prepare yourself because at times you're going to feel like this is absolutely pointless. Now, of course, you should listen to the market a little bit. If no mm. one's ever reading, if you're not seeing any growth ever for a very long time, then maybe you need to change up how you're doing your content. I was still seeing growth. It was just very slow. And it was just like, uh, it was like, you know, very tough, but you know, eventually it took off a little bit more. And now I'm, I'm very happy with the results so far. And you just got to keep at it. I mean, I did it every single, single week. I've published a blog post for 330 something, I think now, or 340, maybe mm -hmm. I think we have over 340. So 340 weeks in a row have not missed a single week. So, yeah. And it reminds me of the podcast when I started, you know, uh, after about a year, my business partner here in Thailand just said, drop it, stop it. You know, you're not going to get, you know, what it's wasting time and, you know, money and all of that. And I just, there was just something in my heart that just said, just, just keep going. Mm -hmm. I've dropped a lot of things in my life, but I think for the listeners out there, pick that thing that you really think, you know, you can make a difference and just keep going. All right. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one 
goes into their worst investment thinking it will be. Tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yes. So it was the summer of 2021. I was out with some friends. We were out, you know, I think we were at a French restaurant in New York City. I think it was Boucherie possible. I can't remember which French restaurant, but we're getting wine, we're getting appetizers, having a great night. And one of our buddies, he's like pretty good at stock picking. He's called a couple of them before. And I, I notoriously am mostly a passive investor. I don't really pick stocks. I had done it twice before that point in time. I had done, I bought two individual stocks. Both of those cases, I basically sold them at cost. I lost money on like opportunity cost basis because I probably should have invested in the S&P 500 where I would have made more. But generally, I, I haven't really lost money in any real investment, just temporarily, but I never really sold for a loss. So I'm like, okay, whatever, no big deal. But, you know, my friends were all drinking, having a good time. And my friend's like, guys, I got this stock. It's I'm telling you, it's going to be big. Um, I'll tell you guys what the stock is. I generally don't try to discuss individual stocks for compliance reasons, but the stock was called Matterport, M-T-T-R. Matterport is like a virtual reality type of like, it's like a software that allows you to, you know, like do 3D imaging of a room. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but early on when they were trying to do like 3D, let's say you wanted to take like a virtual apartment tour, they would have to bring in this special equipment, like with a special camera to do like the 3D imaging so you could walk through a space, right? Matterport figured out a way to do that just using your phone. So anyone with an iPhone or a, you know, Android could just take pictures, you upload them into their system, and then they create a 3D space. So remember, it's summer 2021, crypto is going crazy, metaverse, everything. These are the hottest things out there. And my friend's like, I'm telling you guys, this thing's going, it's going up. It just IPO'd, like it's going to go somewhere. And so like, let's all just put in a little bit of money. So I was like, okay, so I put in like roughly 1% of my net worth. So it's not a, it's not a, a vast amount of money that I'm putting in, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm in on this thing. Right. Um, Crazy enough, you know, we're all having a good time. We start like a group chat. We're chatting about it for a day or two. Then it kind of <laughs> dies off, whatever. We're not really paying attention anymore. Then slowly, I like, you know, I'm not even really, I don't really watch it. I'm not even really watching it because I'm like, if I start watching every I'm going to get obsessed. I'm like, who cares? It's 1% of my net worth, not a big deal. So over the course of like the next few months, like it starts to go up. It's like now it's like September, October. I'm like, wow, it's like gone up quite a bit. I'm like, what's going on? Like, I'm like, oh man, this thing's working out. And then I was at like this art show thing in New York. And I was like, you know, talking to people in the, in the, like the venue and they're like, yeah, you can go to our website here and check this out. So I go to their website and on their website, they were using, they had used Matterport, like to like, you know, uh, to give a tour of their space of their art venue. So like, you could like virtually look at their art venue. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what's the chance that I'm here? Like this thing, it was like kind of crazy. Like there's no way, like, this is so wild, you know? So anyways, then it keeps going up by November, 2021, it had doubled. So I went from, I bought it at $15, by the way. And it mm. doubled to about 30, I think, at that point. And the mm. friend that had, that had invested the stock said, hey, guys, I'm selling out my cost basis, so I'm just going to let the, the gains ride at this point. So, okay, so at, least I'm, you know, at this that. point, he's like, I don't know what's going to happen. This is kind of crazy. I know, I don't usually see stocks double in three months. Um, so that's, that's all I'm going to say. So at that point, we all doubled our money. Everyone was happy. We were like, oh. And I was looking at it like my mental state was like, so at the time when I bought it, like the company was worth like $3.5 billion. That was the market cap of the entire company. You have to realize at this time, like Apple's worth a trillion. Like I think Google was worth a trillion or near it. Like all these companies, like Microsoft was worth a trillion. Like all these companies were worth a trillion dollars. And I'm like 3 billion. And this thing's going to like, you know, disrupt, you know, Facebook, which is worth, you know, I don't know how, you can't remember how much Facebook was, half a trillion, a trillion, whatever mm. it was. It was just a ton of money, right? So, <laughs> so at the time I'm like, what is three billion dollars? It's nothing. Like even I'm like this thing will easily go to thirty billion. This is my logic at the time. Like this will easily go to thirty billion, right? So it went from three point you know three point five to seven billion in two months. I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing's gonna go to thirty, and I'll just sell then. I'll sell at ten. But I'm gonna hold it, you know, because they say let your winners ride. You know, you've yep. heard these these things so many times. I'm like, I'm gonna let this thing ride. You know, funny enough. So the peak was in November, and then price started to come down a little bit, a little bit of a crash. I'm like, hey, no big deal. You know, this you're gonna see this. This is what happens. Every great winning stock has a decline, right? You know this. This is what it's like. You know, no big deal. Funny enough, I was single at the time. And early 2022, so stuff had already started to crash a little bit, but like the price hadn't come down too, too much yet. It, you know, come down a bit, but I was out, you know, I was single at the time and I went to like this, like crypto happy hour thing. And I like met this woman, I was talking to her and she's like, oh, I kind of work in like virtual reality stuff. I'm like, like, what do you mean? She's like, like we do like a long story short, she works at Matterport. I'm like, no <laughs> way. Like I own the stock. We're talking, I'm trying to get inside info from her. I'm like, is there something like, is it going to help? Is, is are you guys coming out with anything that's going to help us? I don't mean inside info, like to trade on. I'm not buying anymore. Mm. Right. But I spent like, I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to be hopeful. Like, is the stock going to come back? She's like, oh yeah, it's so buzzing. Everything's going great. 
Uh, long story short, she was not right there. You know, we didn't go on a date or anything, but it was just funny that I met her. Um, and uh, she was not right about that. The price mm. kept going down, down, and Matterport, um, I sold. So remember, I bought it at $15. It rode all the way up to 30 and I sold it in October 2022 at $3.30 a share for a 78% loss. So that was like... The, that's the whole round trip. You saw it double in, in two months, then the slow, then I'm like seeing it in places. I'm seeing it in my life, like just by chance. I'm like, what the heck? This thing's going to go to, yeah, this thing's easily going to, you know, if I went to, to 30 bucks, it's going to go up, you know, five times more from here. I'm like, it's going to go to a hundred bucks a share easily. And then from there, um, it did not. Obviously, the market crashed. Everything went bad. And so I sold it for a 78% loss. So it wasn't a huge loss of money in terms right. of like absolute dollars, but in terms, you know, and even in terms of percentage of my net worth. But still, you know, I lost basically a percent of my net worth. Um, and, and did going the after company Matterport. go bust or what was the No, the company's result? still around right now. They're around right now. I think they're trading at like 270 a share or something right now. Right. So you can look them up there. They were at 330. So even from where I sold, like it went down a little bit more. So, you know. But uh, yeah, that was it. And and it's so funny because our group chat just got more and more like over time as like the price was going down, we were just getting more and more pessimistic and stuff. And then I finally said, guys, I'm out. I can't keep doing it. And yeah, at this point, I'm like, okay, I'll just take my tax loss, whatever. And so I booked a nice tax loss um, from that, thankfully. So that was the one upside to this. But for the most part, yeah, it was just, uh, it was all the way down. So interesting. <laughs> How would you describe the lessons that you learned? Uh, the lesson, it's funny because I already knew the lesson. Like I, I, you know, I wrote a book, just keep buying. One of the chapters is called why you shouldn't buy individual stocks. I wrote an entire chapter on this. The book had not been published when I bought this, but when I bought um, Matterport, but at the time I was like, you know, it's something fun with my friends, a small amount. So I kind of justified it. But the lesson for me is like, just listen, you know, what's the right thing to do and you're not doing it. Right. And I think there's this great, I think it was Drunken Miller. I think Drunken Miller had this quote where he said like, he lost all this money in the dot-com bubble. And he was like, what was the lesson you learned? He said, I learned nothing. I already knew I wasn't supposed to do that. And that's the exact lesson I will say here. <laughs> I knew I wasn't supposed to do this. I did it for fun. And, you know, I got burned. And I should have, you know, why didn't I just sell someone when I was going up? I There's all these reasons. I mean, think about the logic. Oh, it's easily going to be a, a 30 billion. That's nothing. Like there's like five or six companies trading at a trillion. It's like, who cares about 30 billion? That's like basically zero, right? When you're rounding. So for me, it was like seemed obvious that this was going to thirty billion, and it did not. So, yeah. Uh, interesting. Well, maybe I'll share a couple things that uh, that you made me think of. I mean, the first one, uh, I I call it the white Toyota syndrome, but I can't remember what behavioral bias it is. But once you buy a white Toyota, you'll notice that there are white Toyotas everywhere in the world. In fact, your exact <laughs> model is everywhere. And mm -hmm. I can't remember what that bias is, but when you when you uh, when you get invested in something, you know, you see it everywhere. It, yeah. It's almost no, like is that like availability? Like once you see, like oh, if I say purple elephant, and like guys yeah. look out for purple elephant, you're going to see one in the next week or some, you know, on some brand or something, right? So exactly, either yeah. that. Or we're living in the matrix and some cruel person <laughs> dropped these people in your life, right? Um, either exactly. way, either way, it's a mess. But the second thing, uh, basically, uh, you, you remind me, I, I have a friend, uh, I'll call him RJ. And uh, he was an analyst when I was an analyst back in like 1999. And I was covering the banks and he was covering consumers. And one time I was asking him something and, and he said, well, let's Google it. And I say, like, what does that mean? And he goes, come over to my desk. And he logged up Google and he typed something in and he got, you know, an answer. And from that moment on, RJ is always the guy. I just remember that's the guy that introduced me to Google. It's like mm -hmm. you were going to be the guy that introduced everybody to the most phenomenal business in the world, Matterport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly their website right now. And um, the other thing that uh, I remind, it reminded me of something because you, you said about the, you know, I already knew that I wasn't supposed to do that. And uh, when my mom and dad visited me in Thailand for maybe the first time, I think it was, I told them, look, one thing I'm going to tell you to both of them, don't spend more than a hundred dollars without talking to me. God, I'm mm -hmm. I'm working a bit and I'm I'm busy, but you know my parents go out on some tour and they come back at the end of the day, and and I've just gotten home from work and my dad comes to me and he's like, I 
think I've done something wrong, you know? And I was like, dad, what did you do? And he's like, well, we were on this tour and then they brought us to this jewelry place and I wanted to buy your mother this nice piece of, you know, this nice ring, you know, we're on holiday. And I'm like, how much did you spend? And he's like, I don't know. It was something like, I don't know, $3,000 or whatever he put on his oh, credit card. Gosh. And I was like, no, you know, you're not supposed to do that. But, you know, it's mm -hmm. just funny how, you know, we know we're not supposed to do certain things. And then we stumble into it. Eventually, I called the place and I said, what time you guys close? They said, oh, we close at seven. I said, oh, I think I'm going to get there right on time. They said, we'll, we'll stay open for you. So I said, okay, I'll be there. So I got there with my mom and dad and my best friend. And basically we, we hard negotiated them to give them a full refund of the money, which was um, remarkable. But the point mm -hmm. is, is that, you know, there's a lot of times that we know stuff that we're not supposed to do, but yet we somehow end up in it. So, you know, I just, I just, those are the things that come to mind. Is there anything you would add to wrap up the learnings and lessons? No, I just, yeah, don't buy individual stocks. I still stand by that. I know some people, you know, if you want to do it for fun, that's fine. I kind of was doing it for fun, but I still, if I could go back, I was have been like, hey, don't get caught up in this hype of everything that's going on. You remember 2021, I think probably a lot of your listeners, at least if they didn't get caught up, they know someone who got caught up in the hype of, you know, tech and everything that was going on. And so it can happen to anyone. So just, just remember that, like you're not, everyone's susceptible, even if like you write about why you shouldn't do this stuff. Yep. So. So let's, let's go back to the moment and think about when you first got into this story and all of that, uh, and think about a young person that's presented with a similar situation based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? I mean, it's so tempting. Yeah, I guess it's really tough. I mean, if you're like out with friends and everyone's doing it, it's kind of tough to be the one person out, but like you got you have to be like hey like this is you know i don't know it, it depends like do you think like for example do i if i could go back like do i regret like you know anything necessary like it was a fun thing we did but also like that fun cost a lot of money like maybe i should have i think i should have gone with even less right so if you want to do it say i'll go in and no one said oh you have to put up an x dollar amount so i chose to put in one percent of my net worth i could have put in 0.1 percent of my net worth right so mm. I think the thing to do is like, okay, if you want to play, just wager less, right? If you're going to, if you know, you're going to gamble, just wager even less. And so there's no reason why I needed to put in as much as I did. And so I think that's the actual mistake I made, yep. you know, doing the action of doing something with your friends. I don't think that's a mistake. I just think it's like the amount I put in didn't, was not necessary. No one said I had to, right? So that was the other thing too. So I would say, you know, if you're going to gamble, make sure you know exactly how much you're willing to lose. Great advice. So what's a resource that you recommend for our listeners? Actually, so if it's about individual stocks, there's a great book out there called Scale by Geoffrey West. And um, it's really interesting because I like reading a lot of like, you know, just nonfiction books that aren't about investing to learn about investing. And Scale mm. talks about the growth of cities, um, companies and, and all that type of stuff. And I think the companies section was really interesting because you know, half of the companies that are in like, let's say the S&P 500, they won't be around in 10 years. Like the half-life of a public company is around 10 years, which is kind of crazy. Maybe the S&P 500 is slightly longer, mm -hmm. but it's not that much longer, right? I think the best example of this is like, if you look at all the the um, the stocks in the Dow from like 1920, not a single one of them was in the Dow 100 years later, right? Because they've all like things have happened in different ways and they've fallen out one way or another. So it's kind of crazy to think like, oh, this thing's going to last forever and it doesn't always happen. So I think I really recommend scale. I think that's a great one. Um, if you're like into investing stuff, I'd recommend stuff by William Bernstein. Like he's yeah. really good at like understanding asset allocation and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, those yeah. are the main ones I'd recommend for like other readings. And of course, I would always plug my own book, of course, of I course. just keep buying if you want. I have a whole chapter on this and why like there's mm. the I have a perform. There's the there's two arguments against <clears throat> buying individual stocks. One's the performance argument, which I'm guessing many of your listeners have heard, which is like, hey, like, you know, most investors can't beat the market after fees. So like, what's the point? You shouldn't try. Right. That's that's a pretty simple mm. argument. Most people have probably heard that one before. The argument I have put forth, which I call the existential argument is. How do you know if you're actually good at stock picking, right? And I think the issue with picking stocks and investing is like, you can make a decision now, but you don't get the feedback, the outcome from that decision for years, right? Mm -hmm. Compare that to like a basketball player. They make a decision or take an action. They shoot the ball, let's say. They know right away, like within you know a couple seconds, if they made the right choice, you know, if they did Immediate something correctly, feedback. they get instant feedback, right? Yeah. And they can improve on that, right? But an investor has to make decisions and then wait three to five years, you know, before they see that pan out possibly. It can obviously it can happen sooner, but a lot of times it can 
take a very long time before you see your um, your results. And then on top of that, how do you know that those results aren't just chance, right? And so hmm. you need a long track record. You need at least 10, possibly 20 years before you can show with statistical rigor that you are actually good at this. And so I think for most people, picking stocks is not something they should do. And so I explain all this in the book and go through mm. that argument there, but I think that's kind of another resource you can look to if you want to think about, you know, individual stocks. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, his uh, uh, Nick's book is just keep buying proven ways to save money and build your wealth. And it's impressive. He's got 1,460 ratings and he's got a 4.5 out of five, which is pretty darn good, I would say. And I'll have links to that in the show notes. In addition the other book you mentioned, Scale, The Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, and Companies, written by Jeffrey West. And I'll also have a link to that resource, and I'm interested in both of those. So that's exciting. Um, and now, my last question for you is, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? So yeah, my number one goal right now is pr there's probably... I would say my, yeah, my number one goal is to like expand my SEO traffic on my blog. So I've been writing a lot more for search engines and things like that. So it's a different form of writing, but I find like if I write about topics that a lot of people are searching for, even my core audience will still read them. So even though I'm, it's not like my normal thing to write about something like gener generational wealth or like mm. seven streams of income or something, there's a lot of people searching that stuff. So I found that when I actually try to write for SEO a little bit better and try to rank well in those things, like... Um, I'm just trying to expand my organic traffic because I'm just trying to get different types of discovery. I feel like I've done the Twitter thing to death. Like, you know, if you've been on Twitter, if you've been on finance Twitter for five years and you don't know who I am at this point, then like I've either failed as a marketer or like you're, you're not really on finance Twitter. like this. It's not, it's not a, such a big place. Like, you know, so that's one of those things where like, I don't think I'm pretty saturated in that marketplace. So mm. it's like, I need to find new ways to grow. And so I'm like, okay, I can write about SEO. I can do different things. I'm starting to do more stuff on LinkedIn. So just slowly kind of expanding my brand. And, and I think SEO is the way to go for, for the time being. Yeah. Uh, one of my prior guests, Brandon Gailey, the, uh, the blog millionaire, he's got mm -hmm. a remarkable story and he's just a master at blogging and driving traffic and just impressive. So I have a lot of respect for people like yourself and, and Brandon and others that just keep going at it. I would say I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay at it, but I would say uh, I'm not that great at it. So exciting to hear that. And I wish you luck on that particular goal. And listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you're not join that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Nick, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Uh, no, I don't have any, any particular words. Just keep buying, I guess. <laughs> just keep buying. There's the words. <laughs> it works. <laughs> the three words that just, you know, set up my life. So thank you. Yep. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate it today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.